Hello, the YouTubes. I'm your boy Dave. Your old boy Dave. Yeah, thanks. And I'm the man Jacob. Yes, and today we're going to look at the most invasive upgrade you can do with your PC. Replacing the motherboard. Yes, replacing the motherboard is a serious undertaking. We're not trying to put you off here, but it's only a short hop, step and jump between that and rebuilding your entire PC. And chances are that if you're replacing your MOBO, then you're likely going to be picking a new CPU and there's a chance you're going to need new memory too. But the actual process itself is not actually difficult. So long as you're careful, methodical and don't throw away any screws or cables you might need along the way, you'll be fine. So let's get straight into it. Let's replace that motherboard. If you're using Windows 10, it's worth making sure your OS installation doesn't go screwy when you replace your motherboard, as Windows can get funny when you do such serious PC upgrading. Yeah, if you already sign in with your Microsoft account, then your PC's license will already be associated to it. But if you sign in with a local account, then you might want to do it manually to avoid any issue when you restart. This does change your login from local to a Microsoft account login, but you can revert it later. So just dip into your settings, click on accounts, hit your info, and click sign in with a Microsoft account instead. Then you'll need to enter your account details and password, and Microsoft will then associate your Windows license with your account, so that when you boot back up, your OS remains activated. The first step in an actual build is to remove the old board from within your chassis, and that is no mean feat in itself. Start off by taking out the main power cord from the back of the PC and depressing the power button to discharge any residual energy floating around inside your rig. Yeah, the risk of static or electrical death for you or your components is very slight, but it's worth taking a few precautions. Next order of business is to take out that graphics card, as that will give you more space to work in. Then it's time to detach the CPU cooler from its mounting. If you're replacing an air cooler, then you may need to remove one of the fans, remembering to unplug it from the motherboard first, before you can unscrew the heatsink. But all coolers have different mounting mechanisms. With an all-in-one water cooler, you just need to detach the cooling plate and pump. There's a good chance you can leave the radiator in place in your chassis. We'd also suggest leaving the CPU in the socket too. That will stop you bending the pins as you remove it. You can also leave the RAM in there, as it'll be easier to remove once it's out of the case. Now you need to unplug the mess of cabling that is connecting your board to the rest of the PC. Start with a chunky power cable to the motherboard and then the CPU cable. Then remove the data cabling for your hard drives and or SSDs, but don't worry about removing the power connections going into your storage drives. Finally, remove the front panel, USB and audio cabling too. Now your motherboard should be free from wires and it's just a matter of removing the six or so screws holding it in place. Make sure the chassis is laid on its side for this. With the case free of MOBO, you can fill it up again. So Intel motherboards are more delicate than their AMD rivals, for one reason, the socket. The contact pins are all located inside the socket for Intel while they're built onto the CPU for AMD. That means you need to be careful handling your Intel board during installation. It will have a protective cover over the socket when you first remove your new board from its box, so be very careful removing this. You'll want to get your CPU installed before you get it into the case as you can be more delicate with it. On an Intel CPU, there will be notches in the side of the CPU which line up with the parts of the socket. For AMD, there will be corresponding arrows in the corner of the socket and on the corner of the chip. Get everything lined up and gently seat the CPU. You don't need a lot of pressure to get them in place, so if you feel like you're forcing the issue, you might have it aligned wrong and it will be worth checking. It's worth getting the RAM installed before the motherboard goes in the chassis. Some cases are super easy to work on when the components are all inside, but some can get rather cramped. Before you install the board inside your case, you should also check to see if your cooler's mounting bracket should be installed first. Many modern chassis will have big cutouts in the motherboard tray, so you can access the rear of the CPU to fit any mounting bracket easily. But if you're working with an older case design, you may have to get the bracket fitted before the motherboard is screwed down. These little checks can save you from the pain and ignominy of having to unscrew the board again because you can't get your cooler fixed in place. Now comes the fun part, actually fitting the board in place. But don't forget the I.O. shield. This is the part that is most commonly forgotten and will either leave you with a gaping hole around the rear USB ports or simply not allow you to get your board in place at all. So remove the old shield and fit the new one which you'll find in your motherboard's box. It just pushes into place so this is one component where you will need a little bit of force. If you're swapping a standard ATX board with another ATX board then you can reuse all the same risers which should still be screwed into your case. But if you're moving to a smaller form factor board you may need to rearrange them to match the relevant holes in the PCB. Now you can use the rear connections of the motherboard to align with the I.O. shield and help you get it into place. Make sure there are no cables stuck under the board when you seat it and it should sit comfortably on the risers. All you have to do now is screw it into place. Attaching the cooler should be relatively straightforward if you've been able to get the mounting bracket in place before you screw down the motherboard. 
You'll need a little thermal paste on the CPU before you can screw the cooler down. About the size of two grains of rice in the middle of the heat spreader should do. The action of attaching the cooler itself will spread the gunk evenly across the surface of the processor. Have a think about fan orientation before you screw your cooler into place. Ideally, you'll want any cooler fans to point towards the rear vent of the chassis, working in tandem, not against the flow of any mounted case fans. You need to push air over the fins of the heatsink and vent the hot air outside of the case. When you do screw the cooler down on top of the CPU, be careful not to over tighten it in the bracket. It won't necessarily be a problem, but there is a chance if you screw it down so hard that you could warp the motherboard and break some connections in the PCB. Now your border and cooler are back in the rig, it's time to get everything wired together. This is truly one of the most awkward, boring parts of PC upgrading, getting all those tedious wires back in the right place. For so long as you check and double check, you won't end up with a blank screen when you try and boot. Start with the big cables first and get the motherboard and CPU power cables plugged in. These are the really chunky ones, but your chassis may have cutouts to allow you to route the cables behind the motherboard to keep things tidy. Make sure you've also got your chip chillers fans wired into the relevant headers on the motherboard too. If you're running a water cooler, you'll need to get the pump connected as well. Now it's time to get the front panel connections plumbed into your new board too. There are separate headers for the USB 3.0 and USB 2.0 ports, and like the audio extension plug, they're simple to attach because they'll only go in one way. More awkward are the power, reset, and lighting plugs. Yeah, if you're lucky, your motherboard will indicate where the individual plugs go with a little diagram on the PCB. If not, I'm sorry, but you're gonna have to go and look in the manual. I know, normally we wouldn't advocate such a thing unless it was really, really important. So get those fiddly little cables plugged in and you're almost ready to roll. Well, except for getting your storage cables plugged in. So get the SATA cables from your hard drives and or SSDs connected into the relevant ports of your board. The last step is getting the superstar component of your gaming rig back in place, your graphics card. This is the final thing because otherwise it just gets in the way, making it super awkward to get those cables wired in. You want to get your GPU plugged into the primary PCIe slot. Normally that's the one closest to the processor socket. This is another one of those components where you need to be relatively careful plugging it in. If you feel like you're having to force it, then there might be something in the way, such as an errant wire. It should slot in easily and securely, and once it's in place, you can screw it down to the chassis to stop it waggling around and messing up the socket. Now remember to plug in the PCIe power cables from your PSU2. Without those, you'll either get no output on the screen or just a condescending message from your PC telling you you're a really bad rig builder. Once everything's in place, it can be tempting to close up your chassis straight away, but it's always worth doing the first reboot with the side off so you can make sure all the fans are spinning and there aren't any cables getting in the way. Yeah, so carry out one last check on the important cables and make sure there aren't any loose wires floating around which used to be plugged in. And then turn on the power switch at the back of your PC. You'd be surprised at the number of times that gets forgotten when you're panicking about your PC not booting back up. But really, don't panic if your machine doesn't boot up first time. There are some quick checks you can do which will normally solve a boot problem. First check the power switch and then make sure your RAM is installed correctly. It can be temperamental, so maybe try reseating the modules. It might also be worth loosening your CPU's cooler mounting half a turn in case it's putting undue pressure on the motherboard. Fingers crossed though, everything will be fine and your machine will boot straight away. Windows itself will do all the necessary checks and measures to make sure it's got all the right drivers, but if there are any utilities specific to your new board, you'll have to go to the manufacturer's site and install those yourself. While you're there, it might also be worth checking to see if there's a new BIOS and flashing your board. The methods for doing that can vary between manufacturers, but it's now a little more complicated than downloading the file onto a USB stick and flashing it from your BIOS. So, that's you with your new motherboard in place. Wasn't so tough, was it? Thanks for watching, and if you like what you've seen and heard, give us some subbing love and maybe a like. And we'll see you again for more hardware and gaming goodness here and on the website. Goodbye! Bye!